Hello everyone, thank you for joining today. Um, so I'm very pleased to be introducing you to the uh, HCPC audit webinar, What You Need to Know. Uh, my name is Vicky Harris, I'm the Head of Learning at RCSLT. Um, and I'm really pleased to be able to introduce the presenters who are joining us today. Um, they are, uh, sorry, I'm just going to start with the housekeeping first before I introduce the presenters. Um, the RCSLT staff are on hand with any technical queries and you can get in touch with them via the chat button. So they're always available to help. Uh, also, you can send in questions to our speakers today by using the Q&A button. Um, you should know that this event is being recorded and will be made available on the RCSLT website, along with the presentation slides. Um, and we're really thrilled to be joined by uh, Rebecca, who is a British Sign Language interpreter uh, and we will be uh, pinning her video throughout the webinar, but um, you can pin it to your screen if you want. Um, uh, feel free to pop a message to the host in the chat function if you need any assistance with this or advice. Um, and finally, uh, obviously we always benefit from having evaluation, so we'd be very grateful if you could fill out the evaluation form that will pop up in a new window once the webinar window closes. This will help us to ensure that our webinars are as good as possible and as effective as you need. Uh, and my final point is, um, some of you will be Twitter users, and if you are, that's great because you can join in the conversation using the hashtag, hashtag RCSLT webinar, no gaps or um, underlining there, just all one word. And so I think that's all uh, with the housekeeping. So now I'm going to have the pleasure of introducing the presenters. Um, so first up, uh, we're really pleased to be joined by Natalie Berry, who is the Registration Manager for the Health and Care Professions Council, and she will bring her great knowledge of the process of the CPD audit today. Uh, and then we're going to be uh, handing over to Sean Turk, uh, who is a Pediatric Speech and Language Therapist at Cornwall Partnership NHS Foundation Trust. Um, she uh, was uh, able she had done the audit the last time around in 2019, so she brings the great experience of what it's like to be audited. Uh, and finally, we'll move on to my colleague Mark Singleton, who is a learning officer at the RCSLT, and he will talk to you about how you can use your RCSLT CPD diary in the event of you being called up for audit. So uh, without further ado, I'm very pleased to welcome Natalie. Over to you, Natalie. Thank you very much, Vicky. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you for joining us today. Um, I will be going through the continuing professional development process, um, audit process, which I will refer to throughout the presentation as um, CPD. Um, so what we'll cover off today um, will be just a brief overview of who we are as the Health and Care Professions Council, so the HCPC. Um, and then I'll just delve straight into kind of what is CPD, our five standards, which hopefully you're all very aware of, but I will of course be going through them. And then the CPD audit process. So what happens if you are selected for audit? Um, and I will then obviously touch upon just deferrals if you are selected for audit and you're not able to submit your profile at that time. Um, so just moving forward, um, just a very brief kind of overview of who we are. Um, as mentioned, I'm the Registration Manager at the Health and Care Professions Council, currently responsible for CPD. Um, we are a independent UK-wide statutory regulator. Our powers do derive from the Health Professions Order 2001. Um, and essentially our purpose is to protect the public. So as you can see there, it does say to safeguard the health and well-being of persons using or needing the service of registrants. Separate roles from professional bodies and trade unions. So although we do work very closely, for example, today I'm with the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists, um, we are separate, a separate body to professional bodies and trade unions. Um, and we are overseen by the Professional Standards Authority, which is the PSA, who are the regulators of the regulators, essentially. So I'm just going to move straight into CPD because I know obviously that's why you're all here today. So hopefully um, you'll find this um, helpful and reassuring if, any, if anything. Uh, so what is CPD? So essentially CPD is a way of keeping your skills and knowledge up to date to ensure that you are working safely and effectively, which is very important. Um, it has to be aimed at your kind of uh, scope of practice, so what you're doing within your current or any future roles that you have coming up. 
um, and it's outcomes based. So what that means, it's not based on points and hours. So slightly different to maybe some other regulator requirements or other professional body requirements, we don't count uh, points and hours. And it's self-directed. Um, so what that means that there's no sign off. We trust that you know our registrants, including speech and language therapists, you know when they declare at their renewals, they are keeping um, their skills and knowledge up to date by meeting the CPD standards. That obviously they are in fact telling us the truth that they're doing that. And then obviously we do have an audit process in place. Um, so just moving on from that, that's just capturing what CPD is. Um, I just want to go over the standards. So the first standard essentially is maintaining a continuous up-to-date and accurate record of your CPD activity. Now, this is very important because I don't know about you, but I don't remember what I've done kind of last week, never mind two years ago. So if you are selected for audit, uh, we are asking about your CPD for that, you know, the previous two years. Um, so it can be quite a long time. So it's really important that you log your CPD. Now, um, if I just move into the next slide, I'll just give you kind of a, an idea. I, I just want to point out this is a very brief list. I'm not saying your list has to be this brief, but what I just wanted to highlight that capturing your CPD doesn't need to be complicated um, and the level of detail is relevant to your needs. Now, there's no right or wrong way of doing this. It could be that you have an Excel spreadsheet that you have set up, or it could be that you're using online tools. Now, I know that the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists offer a diary which um, will be spoken about by Mark later on in this, this webinar, um, which allows you to capture the dates and obviously, you know, the activity which you have carried out, um, which is really useful. You know, we do, we don't in any way endorse or recommend how you log your CPD. As I say, there's no right or wrong, but if there are tools available to you that can make your life easier, then, you know, by all means, please do um, utilise that. Please ensure that you do log your CPD as soon after that you, you know you've done it because you may think oh, i'll do it next week and then you forget about it and then you get selected and it's a, it all becomes quite stressful because you're trying to think about well, what did i do on this date and um, the other thing to point out is that it may be on a particular date you did your activity or it could be over a number of days as you can see there there's a variety of ways of logging your dates and again there's no right or wrong so that's around your dated list so then just moving into the other standards now. So I'm just going to move into standard two. Um, essentially, that is to demonstrate that your CPD activities are a mixture of learning relevant to your current and future practice. Um, so just to, just to capture the, the, um, the future and kind of current practice, what we mean by that is to ensure that um, whatever you're doing within your role now, your CPD is relevant. And it may be that you have another role coming up or within your current role, uh, you'll be doing some extra um, habits or responsibilities and therefore your CPD may change and you have to do different things for the future. So I'm just gonna show you some um, activities just to give you an idea of what we mean by a mixture. Um, so we have things like work-based learning, uh, professional activities, formal and educational, uh, self-directed, and I've just put on there other. Now, I do really want to stress the point that there's, um, we have a much longer list on our website of our CPD activities, but again, they're not an exhaustive list. It's just to give you an idea of the different types of learning. And what I um, hear a lot is that, oh, I've done this and I didn't realise actually that is part of my CPD. So if anything today, I hope I'll get you thinking about what you've done in the last two years and what is obviously considered as CPD. Um, so just to briefly go through these, work-based learning, I've just put things like in-service training, reflective practice, work shadowing. Again, these are just some examples. Uh, professional activities, so it could be mentoring or some involvement with your professional body, for example. Um, formal educational, so things like courses, conferences, research. This is the one that normally stands out. People think all oh, CPD has to be a fancy formal course. Not at all. I mean, of course, that can contribute to your CPD, but it's just one part of um, the activities that you can do to undertake CPD. Self-directed learning, um, so things like reading journals, books, e-learning, internet research. Um, you may have found, because obviously of the challenges the last year, that you've done a lot more self-directed learning than normal. Um, and then other things like voluntary work. But again, that, you know, you may have drawn in your skills and knowledge within that role. But again, this is just to get you thinking and just a bit of an idea. Um, but the main thing is you're doing a mixture. So the key message to get across today is don't just stick to one type of learning. 
and don't worry so much about what you're doing does it fall in this category or you know this you might find there's an overlap for example some work-based learning may kind of overlap into formal learning so don't worry too much about the category just more thinking about ensuring you're doing a mixed one so just moving on um, i'm just going to capture standards three and four which um i captured together because essentially it is to seek to ensure that your cpd contributes to the quality of your practice and service delivery and seek to ensure that your cpd benefits your service user so in this part here, you're thinking about the CPD in which you're doing, how is it benefiting you and your service user? The question I get asked a lot is, well, who's my service user? Um, and you'll probably find everyone watching today may have very different service users. And that may be because one of you may be in academia, you know, you may work within a university and therefore your service user may well be your students or your fellow colleagues. It could be that you're in a managerial role and therefore your service user may well be uh, your members of your team. Or it could be that you're seeing patients and therefore your service user is your patients. You will find you'll probably have more than one service user. And the rule of thumb, I always say, is think about who's affected by your practice. Anyone that is affected by your practice um, is deemed your service user. So just to get you thinking about that and how your CPD impacts them, as well as obviously benefiting yourself. So just the last standard, that is standard five, and that's submitting a profile for audit. Um, and it basically says upon request present a written profile just to clarify we don't want you sitting there handwriting a profile by any means and um, what we're just saying is that if you are selected for audit you do need to submit a profile to us um, it's not optional um, we do now have a online system to submit your profile on but you can only use that part of the system if you are selected for audit um, at renewal two and a half percent of those invited to renew are randomly selected for audit and those selected for audit do need to submit the profile by the end of the renewal period, which is the same deadline as your registration. Profiles are assessed and reviewed by our HCPC partners um, who are CPD assessors. And what I just would like to point out here is that they are on our register um, and there'll be at least one from um, your profession. So there'll be at least one speech and language therapist. But nine out of 10 times, it tends to be both from your profession. The reason why we can do that is because all 15 professions in our register share the same CBD standards. But it's just a good point to make that, you know, our CBD assessors themselves can be selected. They are our registrants and they are bound also by our standards. So they're the best people placed to assess your profile as opposed to myself or my team. And um, so just to give you some reassurance, it is assessed by one of our partners. Um, so just moving on there, so I mentioned about evidence. So the other part of your profile um, is that if you are selected, um, you do need to provide some evidence. Now, I do wanna just point out, you don't need to provide evidence for every bit of your CPD activity you've done in two years, because that would be a, a horrendous amount of you know, evidence. And we don't expect, we don't, want you, we don't want this taking up too much of your time or you having to you know, get stressed about having to find different uh, pieces of evidence so you can actually pick which activities you're going to speak about and which ones you will evidence um there's just some examples here so it's not evidence in a court of law don't worry it's not that stringent or strict it is more kind of um for example attending today is part of your cpd which is great so again thank you for attending um you'll share you know you'll get the powerpoint slides after um this webinar it may be that you've done some notes as well of reflection what you've learned from this so all of that is evidence that you can submit with your profile if you're selected. Um, it may be that yourself you've delivered a presentation, so it could be materials from your presentation, it could be induction materials for new staff, um, you know, even down to personal development plans, reflection notes. Again, we have a much longer list on the website of what would be deemed as evidence, just to give you an idea. But I'm just gonna move into now, um, just around the CPD profile, and what is actually required of you. And I, th I feel like this part here is probably the most important and hopefully the most reassuring once I break it down to you that it's not this hideous, horrible task if you are selected for audit, because I know how daunting it can be. So I hope I can offer some reassurance today. Um, so if you are selected, and this is only if you are selected, so if you are on that random two and a half percent and we say, you know, hi there, you have been selected, what we want from you, and again, this is to be done on, on our online system, which is broken into four sections. Um, first and foremost is a list of your CPD activities over the two year period. It has to be within that two year period. Anything outside of that won't be looked at or considered. 
Um, there's two ways of doing this. You can upload a list. Um, so, you know, if you are, for example, using the um, portal available to the diary to log your CPD, you could obviously download um, your list that you can upload with your dates and your activities. Um, or you can input manually into the system each of your activities over the, the two years and just a brief description of what they were. Um, how this demonstrates you meet standards and what standards this is linked into. If you think about obviously what I mentioned as standard one, so obviously you'll be meeting standard one by doing that. Um, but also standard two is run a mixture. So this allows the assessors to see there has been that mixture because they'll be able to see what activities you've been doing. Um, any gaps larger than three consecutive months must be explained with the reasons why that most, you know, why there's been no CPD. Um, and then there is a section in the online system around summary of recent work and your personal statement. Um, essentially, summary of work is who are you, what do you do, what's your job, uh, what role might you have coming up that's relevant to the CPD you're doing now, what have you been doing the last two years, and it's just to kind of help the assessors, you know, paint a picture of who you are and what you do, and it allows them to then be able to assess your CPD and your profile. 500 words is just an estimate. It's just, an, you know, to give you an idea. It doesn't matter if it's less or more. There's no penalties. It's just to give you an idea. Um, so statement of how the standards have met. So this is like your personal statement, which we recommend around 1500 words. So this makes up the bulk of your profile. Um, and what I mentioned before is have a look at your dated list. Pick four to six examples I would recommend that are a mixture. So not all just like formal learning, maybe some self-directed, some formal, some work related and talk about them. You know, talk about how did it benefit you? How did it benefit your service user? Really reflect on those activities. Um, you know, and this is what's going to demonstrate, going to demonstrate that you meet standards three and four. And then standard five, which mentioned about the evidence, you can then evidence those four, four to six activities and then obviously submit your profile, which will then allow you to meet standard five. And by doing these four components that I've mentioned, um, that would obviously then, you know, the assessor can then assess that you've met the standards. But I hope by breaking it down just makes it a little, into bite-sized chunks, makes it a little bit easier to understand what's required from you. So just moving on, um, obviously, you know, we're very mindful of the HCPC, the impact um, the last year has had on all of us, um, particularly those in the healthcare professions um, and, you know, the challenges that you face. So I thought it would be helpful just to kind of uh, just go over some tips for completing a CPD audit if you are selected. Um, obviously, the renewal and audit process for your profession is coming around this year, so I just thought it'd be helpful to include this. Um, so reflect on your self-directed learning through the pandemic. So you probably will find during that time, and I, you know, we completely understand it, it was a very extremely busy time. So there may have been points that, you know, CPD did take a bit of a sidestep, and we, we do understand that, but there probably were times where you had time to self, um, self-directed learning. So whether it may be more use of online facilities and things like that. So definitely home in on those and talk about those. The assessors are mindful there might be, um, a slightly less of a mixture in the last year because of the restrictions and the challenges we faced, and they will bear that in mind when assessing your profile. Reflect on the training through the pandemic. So it may be that you've done training that was actually more um, <clears throat> as a result of the pandemic. Again, all of this is relevant to your CPD though, because it would have benefited um, your practice and also your service users. So there could be a number of different, you know, if you're training on PPE or something similar, Again, all part of your CPD, so don't, don't overlook any of that training. Don't struggle to fill in the COVID gaps. So I mentioned before, three consecutive months, if there is a gap, it needs to be explained. If you find there is a larger gap um, where you feel that you may not have done CPD or there's a, there's a, you felt, felt ill, unfortunately, or something, or there was a good re you know, there was a reason to why, explain that in your, your dated list um, or in your uh, personal statement to explain why there is a gap to allow the assessors to understand why there is that gap in your CPD. Um, don't record all your work activity. So what we don't want to see, for example, if you have a weekly three o'clock Wednesday team meeting, which is kind of part and parcel of your job that you do, we, we don't really want to see that in your activities. However, um, if from that meeting, it was deemed that you're going to go and do a bit of work shadowing, for example, then obviously that could be 
form part of your CPD, but kind of the day to day of what's expected to you um, and your work tasks won't be uh, counted as CPD. So just try and have a think about that as well. Uh, don't limit yourself. So I would recommend having a look at the CPD activities on our website um, and thinking about there's probably a, there, there probably are some things you've done that you don't recognize as CPD, but actually are. And it's asking yourself a few questions. Did I learn anything from this? If so, what was it? Has it changed the way I've done things? Has it benefited my service users? So when you start answering some of those questions and you start thinking, well, yeah, actually it has, that's part of your CPD. So definitely don't limit yourself um, to just particular activities. Um, and show how your CPD meets the standards key. So I've gone through the profile um, and the four sections. So if you kind of stick to kind of, you know, the way I've described it and breaking it down and what's advised for each section, um, you should hopefully then be able to demonstrate you meet the standards quite um, quite easily. Um, so we will share these slides and just at the bottom, what I've provided you with is a blog that I've put together with a lot more detail on just top tips for completing the audit following COVID-19 and also a webinar I recently done, which is similar to this, but it's, it's a lengthier uh, version with a bit more detail um, that I, I, I undertook in April. So please do have a watch with, of that and share, feel free to share with your colleagues as well. So just moving on, um, I'll just run through this very quickly. I just thought it'd be nice to get some graphics on the screen. So um, we have the renewal process on the left. And then if we just move on to the diagram to the right, you will see um, the CPD process runs in parallel to renewals. However, it is a separate process. So my recommendations to you are, if you are selected for audit, you will get separate communication around this. Um, please, please ensure your email address, um, well, all your contact details are up to date, but most importantly, your email address and your home address are up to date with us. Um, and, you know, we will contact you separately um, from renewals if you are selected for audit. The deadline for both, as mentioned, is the same. Um, and while your profile is being assessed, you will you can continue to practice and will remain on the register. My best advice to you would be to ensure to renew your registration, which is a lot quicker process, as soon as you can, and then obviously start completing your CPD just to make sure that your registration is renewed. So I'm just going to move on to just briefly covering deferrals. If you find you are selected and unable to uh, complete the profile at that time, you can request a deferral on our online system. Reasons for deferral could be things like maternity leave, long-term sick, bereavement, um, you know, any exceptional circumstances really. We do ask for forms of evidence um, and an explanation to why you're requesting a deferral. That deferral is then looked at by myself or my team leader um, and they're dealt with by, you know, on a case by case basis. So do provide us with detail and evidence if you feel that time. Being busy um, is not a reason for deferral, but we are trying to be as flexible as possible. So if it is that you need a bit more time because we offer the three months, but if it is that you need maybe a bit more time, you can uh, request an extension um, to us and we will consider it again case by case. So the main message I'm trying to get across is if you are worried about the order and you've been selected, please, please be in contact us and we will support you in the best way we possibly can. So just moving on, um, just kind of wrapping up now. So resources available. We have tons of resource on our website. Um, it's just a normal uh, hcpc-uk.org forward slash CPD. Um, and on there you'll find um, things such as kind of the online videos that we have if you are selected, our CPD and your registration booklet, which is really useful, that has all those activities I spoke about as well. And we also have sample profiles, although, although the format of those is different to the online system now, the content may still be able to give you an idea of what's expected from you. Um, so just wrapping up now, um, I hope you found that useful. If anything, I hope you found that reassuring as well. Um, things to remember that if you are selected for audit, you will receive an email and a letter. Um, this is separate to your renewal invitation. Um, and I would say within about 10 days of the renewal window opening, so the, from the first of that month, which is the 1st of July this year for you, um, if you've not received anything, you can probably sigh, uh, give a sigh of relief that you probably haven't been selected. However, please ensure your details are up to date, because if they're not, it could be that we've tried to contact you and not been able to get through to you. Um, you can continue to practice during the audit process, and don't forget to obviously include your data list, which is very important. 
any gaps more than three consecutive months must be explained. And please, please don't send us any identifiable information. So if you have a piece of evidence that may have a service user name on it, please ensure that it is redacted before you send it to us. Um, and as mentioned, speech and language therapist from your window opens on the 1st of July this year. Um, so I, I hope that you found uh, that helpful. Um, so just moving on to um, uh, the, the next speaker is Sean Took, who's a paediatric speech and language therapist um, based in Cornwall, who will be talking about her experience of being selected for CPD. I'll hand you over to Sean now. Thank you for listening. Brilliant. Thanks, Natalie. Hi, my name is Sean, and I work as a paediatric speech and language therapist in Cornwall and I was called to audit by the HCPC in 2019. I'm going to share with you an outline of my experience going through the process, as well as a few pointers and examples of specific activities that I hope might be useful for you should you be called to audit this year. So we all know as professionals registered with the HCPC that we could get called to provide evidence of our continued professional development and for speech and language therapists this year is audit year. I remember registering with the HCPC as a newly qualified therapist and learning about the audit and thinking at the time that I hope it never happened to me. I think a lot of people hear the word and panic and worry about receiving the notification that they are required to submit a profile. I'd like to start by offering reassurance and say that if you take one thing away from what I talk about today, take this. It isn't scary. It isn't a process there to catch you out. Ultimately, I actually felt more secure in my CPD practice following going through the audit process. So firstly, you will um, receive notification informing you that you've been randomly selected for audit for your CPD. And mine came in the form of a letter with a handy how to guide that Natalie referenced in her presentation, um, which really did support me in completing my profile. The guide how to complete your continuing professional development was really vital and it gave me confidence when I went through the process and I found it talked me through from start to finish, gave really clear pointers on where I could get more information from. And ultimately, as I worked on completing my profile, I continued to refer to it regularly. Once I'd received notification, I took time to look at all the online resources. I'd also attended the version of this webinar held back in 2019 and I referred back to my notes from that as well as exploring the HCPC and the RCSLT websites. Further to this, I spoke to the team that I work with and I had colleagues who'd been through the process previously and they were willing to share their knowledge and experience, as well as discovering that there was actually one other team member who'd also been called to audit in 2019. And that was really fortunate and we were able to check in and support each other as we completed our profiles. The, next, the first decision that I had to make when completing my profile was how I wanted to submit it. And I decided that doing it digitally and submitting it by email was right for me. In 2019, there was that option um, of submitting it as paper as well. And I know that there have been some changes. And as Natalie said, there's now also access to an online portal um, on the HCPC website. I then used the how-to guide to set up my profile. And it felt a bit like going back to university and beginning an essay laying out the page with headings and subheadings and different word counts for sections. Following this, I thought about how much time I was going to need to assign getting everything completed within the three month time frame. For me, the letter arrived right at the start of July and I had until the 30th of September to submit the completed profile. With this falling over the summer holidays, I blocked out days that around my annual leave and um, prior other work diary commitments. And overall, I think it took me somewhere in the region of three to four days to complete the profile broken up over the three months. And we all work differently and at different speeds. So it's important to think about how much time you might need and so that you don't feel rushed as that September deadline approaches. For me, working with a paediatric caseload, I also knew I wanted to complete it before the autumn term started and that my work became more hectic again. Before I talk in more detail about the profile itself, I just wanted to talk a bit about continued professional development and what it actually means. So having spoken with colleagues, I know that there are numerous ways that we all record and keep track of our activities. Some of us use the Royal College Online Diary, a one-stop shop for recording, tracking and uploading your evidence. Some use other systems available to them at work. For example, in Cornwall, we have a system called HARP that allows us to keep track of supervisions and also add CPD activities and evidence to should we wish. 
I know of some speech therapists who have CBT, CBD recorded in their work diary or on pieces of paper, and some prefer to like, use a document that they've created themselves. So evidently there isn't one preferred way. What matters is that you do have a record and that you're regularly completing a variety of activities. And these should include activities that come under the headings of work-based learning, professional activity, self-directed learning and formal education. If you aren't sure what heading a certain activity might come under, then there are some really handy lists on the HCPC and RCSLT guidance around this. When I came to complete my profile, I'd mostly been using the online diary on the Royal College website, and the diary had been going through a bit of a facelift around that time. However, I was still able to access and download all the data that I needed. On reflection, having gone through the process in 2019, I would say that my recording of CPD is now much more improved. I'd like to think that I'm more timely in inputting new activities into my diary and try to regularly look back through my work diary at what I've done and what could count towards my CPD. Remembering that the profile you requested to complete for audit only focuses on the last two year period, you aren't expecting to provide evidence of all the CPD that you have ever done. When completing my profile, I found ensuring that I had the evidence to support the CPD claims took some time to collate. Examples of this included digging out a certificate from a course I'd attended the previous year and editing documents from work-based activities to anonymize them, ensuring confidentiality was maintained. Not every CPD activity your list requires evidence, and I'll go on to talk about that in a moment, but it might be worth thinking now about how you file associated documents and keep track. Regardless of whether you do or don't get called for audit this year, it's part of our professional working responsibility to maintain records of our CPD. I'm now going to talk about the sections that make up the profile, and it's made up of these main sections, a summary of the practice over the last two years, a statement of how you've met the standards of CPD and evidence to support your statement and CPD claims. Note that the word counts say up to um, so many words, so it might depend on a few factors and I'll talk about these as I talk about each section in a bit more detail. So firstly you have the summary of your practice history of the last two years. It might have been a really eventful time when you change roles, move jobs, so you might have lots to write. For some people, perhaps, you've been on maternity leave, so all the time in your job role has maybe remained the same. So this might not therefore require the whole 500 word limit. And I think I found that probably the easiest section of the profile to write. With 2020 being an eventful year, to say the least, and some speech therapists getting redeployed, I'd like to think that there might be some really interesting practice summaries submitted this year. The next part, the statement, is the main body of the profile, hence the higher work limit word limit. And the final section is your supporting evidence, appendix of documents that you refer to within your statement. And I'll now go on to talk about the profile and the CPD evidence in more detail. So as I mentioned, the main part of your profile is your statement, and this is your chance to demonstrate how over the last two years you've met the standards. The main bulk of what you write in this section will be relating to standards three and four, showing how your activities benefit service users and improve the quality of your work. Some people may have a personal development plan at work and there is guidance provided on how to use this to support the writing of your statement. I didn't have one, so I used the other suggested way of structuring this section and used the CPD standards as subheadings followed by explanations and then evidence. I mentioned earlier that the HCPC How To Guide, and I want to reiterate again that it really is worth using these resources that are provided as well as looking at the online videos and instructional guides when completing the profile. When you're sat looking at that blank screen with the top word limit of one and a half thousand words, it's daunting, but there are clear structures and pointers on what to write, so it just really makes sense to use them. I thought it might be useful to share with you some examples of what I put in my statement. Using the CPD standards to structure mine, it came together a bit like this. So standard one is maintaining accurate and up-to-date activities. For this, I wrote a couple of paragraphs on how I'd achieved it. I then started to achieve evidence, sorry, what I was providing to back up these claims. I attached my pro to my profile as an appendix, a detailed list of all my activity and a copy of my RCSLT diary that in 2019, I was able to request and download from the website. I've included here a screenshot of a section of my dated list of activity on this slide, just to show you an example of what I had completed. 
These include things such as reading articles within the bulletin magazine, attending webinars and reflecting on work-based activities that I had done for the first time. When I submitted my profile, it, all, it wasn't all done online, so I created a table in Word. And now this part might be done for you on the online portal. Um, so you could potentially just input readily into a ready-made form. I chose to use a color-coded approach to show what I'd achieved um, through the range of CPD activities in the two-year period. My statement continued with standard two. Again, for this, I wrote a few paragraphs demonstrating how my CPD was a mixture of learning activities. My evidence here directed the assessors to look at my detailed list of activities, as I just showed you on the last slide. The color coding I chose, I felt highlighted this standard in a clear and visual way. Other evidence I provided included notes relating to my completed NQP competencies and a copy of performance review work. Um, these were used to show how I was maintaining good work and awareness of the HCPC standards of practice. As I mentioned previously, three and four are the main standards that you need to evidence within your statement. The previous two standards could be represented with reasonably brief explanations, and if you're keeping records of your CPD, should be easy to evidence. For these two standards, I chose to give five examples of activities and provided details about each one. In the how-to guide, it suggested using between four to six examples. My five activities that I wrote about were using a new target sheet that had been developed within our service, and talking about the transition from one way of working to another, reading journal and bulletin articles and reflecting and showing how these had impacted on my development and also benefited service users. I'd also been fortunate to attend Palin PCI and Nuffield training courses and was able to provide copies of my attendance certificates to back this up. During the two year period, I'd had a student with me on placement. This is a great example of CPD activity. I always find having students opens up learning and reflection opportunities. And lastly, I wrote about a piece of work I'd completed, creating a traded services agreement document. I was able to anonymize this and submit a copy of the paperwork as evidence. These are examples personal to my CPD and work life, but I hope they might give you some ideas on what sort of submit familiar activities you might be able to reference within your profile. And there we have it, an outline of the profile completed, your practice summary followed by a personal statement and supporting evidence. So the fifth HCPC standard that completing your profile is looking to ensure you are maintaining is ultimately completing the profile with evidence and returning it when requested. Once I'd completed my profile, I submitted it by email to the HCPC and waited. I was given an estimated time of eight to 12 weeks for processing of the profile once I had submitted it. I received notification of passing the audit by email actually on my birthday in November 2019, and thankfully it was a good outcome. It was then just a case of continuing on with working life, ensuring that I was completing a range of activities and recording it and remembering that just because I'd been called to audit once didn't mean that I couldn't be called again. So I hope that sharing my experience has been useful. And if you want to see more examples of the completed profiles, these can be seen on the HCPC website. Remember, using the guidance, seek support if you need it, and I hope that if you do get called to complete your profile this year, you'll feel more equipped in doing so, having listened to these presentations. I will now hand you over to Mark Singleton, who's the learning officer for the RCSLT. Thank you, Sean, and thank you to Natalie as well. Two incredibly useful presentations. Um, so I'm just gonna share my screen now um, and just, like Vicky's already said, I'm just going to walk through kind of very quickly how to use the diary and also how to export your diary um, should you be called to order. Um, so this is, as I'm sure most of you will know what the diary looks like. Um, and when you're adding activities, and I think this is this is something that not many people realize, you don't have to do a huge amount when you first add the activity. So I understand sometimes you might do some CPD and not really have time to genuinely reflect on it and add all of the information in that you want to. Um, so I'll just use test activity as, as a test. Um, but all you need to do is add that in and it will then save it just here in the activities without professional development goals section. And that can just serve as a reminder to you that you need at some point to 
add some detail and properly reflect on the learning itself. Um, obviously, try and give it a title that will make sense to you in maybe a week's time when some of the detail has been lost. Um, and when you're ready to fully add the detail and reflect on it, um, you just click on it and this is what you'll see. Um, first of all, you can add it to a professional development goal. You're not obliged to. There, there's no HCPC requirement to a, attach it to a goal. It's more if you want to group similar um, CPD items together. So for example, if you're working towards a new role or you're building your capability in a specific clinical area, you can set up a professional development goal that will help you to keep all of that CPD together. Um, next, you can allocate a type to the activity. Um, we've just copied the HCPC activity types. So again, if you are called to audit and you've added types to each of your activities, that will just help you to look at your mix of CPD and make sure you are doing a mix of things. Um, you can add a brief description here. It doesn't need to be an essay. It can just say very briefly what, what the learning was about and what you did. So for example, it might be that you read an art, article in Bulletin, in which case all you need to say is um, read an article in Bulletin. Um, because you'll do more by way of reflection on the right hand side. Um, you pop the date in. So, for example, where are we? We're on the 10th. Um, and the number of hours. Um, so, that's kind of how long the activity took you. So, you can put an hour and then 15 minute intervals as well, depending on how long it took you. Just make sure you hit update and see that green banner at the top to show you that you've saved it. Um, then you can put the reflections in. So again, these questions were designed to help you truly reflect on what you did. And also in terms of the HCPC audit, it will help you in answering the questions around how your CPD is relevant to you and how it benefits your service users. Um, so you can put a little bit more information in the what did you do box around what it was you did. So for this example, you'd probably expand on read an article in bulletin and say what it was what it was called and kind of the, the main thrust of the article. Um, you can then say what what it is that you learned from this CPD activity. So again, it might be maybe a, some new research into an, um, a clinical area. It might be a new technique or it could be something more general, like kind of potentially more communication skills or anything like that. Um, and here's when you can say, as a result of that learning, what is it that you now do differently or that you've started doing that you didn't do before, or maybe even that you've stopped doing um, as, as a result of the learning. Um, and that very much ties into how that CPD activity was relevant to you and your role or a future role. Um, and finally, you can say who's benefited. So this is where you can really look at how this was of benefit to your service users. So, you know, it could be patients or it could be, as Natalie said, it could be um, students or something like that. Um, just go into a bit more detail about who it was and how it's going to benefit them. And again, once you're done, just click the update button below to make sure it saves. You'll get, if I put a little bit of text in, you'll again get that green banner there to, to say that it has been saved. Um, you can also upload evidence. So if you've got maybe a kind of a, a certificate, you can either take a photo and upload that, or if you've got a, a PDF version of a certificate, you can upload that here. You just click the upload button and find the, um, the relevant document on your computer. And you can also add links. So if your CPD activity was watching a video or it was reading an article online, you can add a link to it so that it's easy for you to remember specifically what that learning was that you did. Um, and that's in a nutshell, how you use the diary. Um, and then if you are to be called to order, um, there's a button up here at the top called export. And that's how you get a download of everything in your diary um, that you can then use to fill in the CPD profile. Um, so you just hit export and then confirm. 
And what that will do is send an email to the email address you have registered with us um, with a, um, an Excel spreadsheet attached with everything in it. Um, it can occasionally go into your junk um, just because it's from an automated email address and it does have an attachment on it. Um, but all you'd need to do in that case is move it into your inbox. And I'll just open it up so you can see what it looks like. So this is how it will come out. Um, obviously, your, your download is likely to be a lot more detailed than mine. This is just a test account we use for demo purposes. Um, but you'll have all of your activities up here. Um, and if you only need the activities from kind of the last two years for the HCPC audit, all you'd need to do is filter it. And then you can just pick the relevant years. So if you don't need data from that long ago, you can exclude it and then it will come up here instead. And I think in a nutshell, that's it. Um, so I will try and pick up any questions that have come through while I've been speaking. Um, but in the meantime, I'll pass back to Vicky. Thank you, Mark. And uh, thank you also, John and uh, Natalie. And of course, Rebecca for the great uh, sign language interpreting throughout that. Um, that's great. Thanks. Are we um, pleased to have some questions already in from some of the participants. So um, I think the first lot probably will I will direct at Natalie. Uh, so the first one that came in is from Emily, who says um, regarding the evidence to provide, does it have to be digitized or can it be paper based? So if I can direct that one to you, please, Natalie. Yeah, so we have now introduced, as mentioned, our CPD online system. Um, as Sean mentioned previously, it was email or paper. Um, we've now come away from that. Um, so now any registrant that is selected for CPD does need to use the online system. Um, so in terms of evidence, it will need to be uploaded. Um, and there's a, no a number of different types of documents that we accept. And it may even be that if you can take a clear picture of the evidence and upload that that can work we've seen registrants do that as long as we can read it that's most important but yeah we don't we no longer accept emails or posted profiles we've kind of got with the time now so yeah we're, we're online finally brilliant thank you um and millie asked um i was redeployed into hospital maternity during covid that's probably quite a, a sort of common scenario um, does the training from this count, even though it's not directly uh, speech and language therapy related? And again, that's probably a question for Natalie, really, please. Yeah, absolutely. We have seen a lot of this uh, recently. And it, any training that you have done or any um, CPD you've done during that time um, would be considered because, you know, when we speak about that um, summary of practice, um, and just, you know, who, your summary of work, that's where you'll be explaining who you are and what's happened in the last two years. So the assessors will be aware of your circumstances. Um, and obviously the CPD you carried out during that period of being redeployed um, essentially is considered your CPD as well. So yeah, just to reassure you that that's absolutely fine. Any training that you carry down, as long as you can relate it to your practice during that time and just explain to the assessors where you're redeployed to. And you probably will find there is some skills and knowledge you were pulling on um, from your previous role. Um, so yeah, just having a think about all of that, but yeah, it would definitely be considered. Wonderful, thank you. Um, then we've got a question uh, from Anonymous, uh, uh, an anonymous person. Uh, regarding deferrals, could someone theoretically defer twice in a row? For example, if they were on maternity leave for the first time they were selected, and then on long-term long sick leave the next time. Um, Natalie, I think, again, that's probably a question for you, please. Yeah, that's fine. Um, yes, they can. I mean, each deferral request is dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis. We do see very rarely that uh, some registrants are deferred more than once because, unfortunately, things can happen in life and we have to be flexible and understanding. So, yeah, we, we've had similar situations and given the circumstances, we can then defer again. That's not a problem. Obviously, they would have to put in another deferral request at the time of being selected again. Okay, that's really useful. Thank you. Um, then got another question in from Sam. Uh, not all CPD results in you doing things differently. Is it acceptable to the HCPC that CPD can confirm or update your knowledge and that you haven't necessarily changed your practice, 
It is difficult to find new CPD if you're specialised in a specific field and work independently. So I wonder, again, if I can put that to you, please, Natalie. Yeah, of course. Um, what I would say to that is absolutely. I mean, what you will find, and I think I mentioned in the presentation that you may go into something or do CPD and think you're going to get something from it, but actually you don't or you didn't get as much as you wanted or actually it's just reinforced some of the learning you already know. That's absolutely fine because what we're saying is keeping your skills up to date in order to work safely and effectively. So it may be that you've gone along and done something and it's just reinforced what you're already doing is the correct way of doing it. And therefore you've kept your skills and knowledge up to date. So you can explain that uh, in your profile um, or even if it's just one thing you've learned to do a bit better. Um, again, you can explain that from that activity. So yeah, that, that's completely acceptable as well, as long as it's explained in the profile. Great, thank you. Um, there is uh, one more question in. I'm just going to mention that if anyone has any questions for Shard on, on the experience of going through audit or Mark on the, the practicalities of getting your um, your putting data into the CPD diary or getting it out ready for the audit, if, if they can send questions in now while well, we still have a few more minutes. Um, so we've got a question in while um, people might be furiously typing. Um, is that from Sam says, is there a maximum amount of times you can be called for audit, please? And again, Natalie, I, I should think. Um, there's not a maximum amount of time because it's a random uh, selection. Um, you can be audited more than once. Um, we have seen cases of someone being audited twice. Very rarely we've seen, and depending on the profession, because some have gone through CPD for many years, in occasions we have seen three, but these are these are rare. Um, it's obviously because, and it is a completely random selection, so, um, which I can assure you it is. So there's not a maximum, we don't cap it. I mean, essentially it's for a different two year period, and obviously you are expected to do your CPD. Um, so I know it may feel a little bit unfair if you're selected again, but your colleague over here has never been selected. I can completely empathise with how it might feel a little bit unfair, but it is a random selection. What we wouldn't want to do is kind of exempt anyone for a different two year period just because they've gone through audit before. So no, there's no maximum um, and you can be audited more than once. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we don't have any questions in currently. We have uh, just uh, about five more minutes left. So. Well, if anyone is, oh, we've got one in just off, hot off the press from Glenda, who says um, to all panelists, I work in a school and have roles in addition to being a, a, an SLT. Can I add CPD activities more focused on other roles I take in the school? Um, probably again, Natalie, that, that is one for you, I'm afraid. Thanks. Um, we find this very often with our professionals that they may be doing more than one role. Um, I probably would put the ball back in your court and say, you know, what, what you're doing in this other role, is there parts of it that is allowing you to draw on your skills and knowledge or benefiting some of the practice within your speech and language therapist role? Um, you may find that there is, and if there is, then obviously do by all means include that in your CPD profile. If it's completely unrelated and there's absolutely kind of no connection or there's no skills or knowledge being drawn um, within your other role, um, we'd probably say that, you know, it doesn't need to be mentioned um, because the assessors won't see things relevant to obviously, um, you know, what you're doing within your scope of practice. So I think I'll put, the, you know, it's asking yourself a few questions. You may well find there is stuff that is overlapping or there's transferable skills there that you can actually use. And if there are, by all means, do mention some of the activities you do within the other role as well. Great. Thank you, Natalie. Um, we've just got one actually for Mark this time, I think. Um, uh, an anonymous attendee says, does the download from RCSLT log uh, download each year separately or everything from the, the beginning of the log? I wonder if you can answer that, please, Mark. Yeah, sure. Um, it downloads everything from the beginning of the diary. Um, so that's why I recommended using the filter option um, in the in the spreadsheet itself, particularly if you're kind of using it for the, um, the HCPC audit. Um, just because for for quite a few of our members now, they're, they're going to have, you know, around a decade's worth of CPD in there. So, yes, it will give you all of it, but you can just filter out the stuff you don't need for the audit period. Thank you, Mark. Uh, and it's, it's worth saying that um, if you have any difficulties doing that, please do um, call our inquiries line because, because we're here to help. And we appreciate that uh, you're all very busy and probably... Uh, 
uh, the last thing you may want is to have uh, the HCPC audit, but as, as uh, Sean said, it's, it's very worthwhile when you go through it, but you may initially uh, feel like, oh my goodness, what do I need to do now? Uh, and we are happy to talk you through any stage of this. So don't panic, there's support. It uh, is a process that you can go through and we'll be on hand to help. Um, so that's very important. I'm just looking at the time. Uh, got maybe a couple of minutes left. Um, this is a very interesting question in from Louise. Does the selection take a higher quota of, uh, say, newly qualified SLTs or those approaching retirement? Um, and again, I think, Natalie, if you could answer that, please. Yeah, of course. Um, it doesn't. What, um, what I did mention in my presentation is that if someone is newly qualified, they do need to be on the register for continuously two years before they're selected to obviously give them a fair time to pull together and do their CPD. Um, in terms of the random selection, just to kind of give you a bit of detail, um, we basically take anyone who um, is exempt, for, so for example, anyone in a fitness to practice um, status or anyone that hasn't been on the register continuously for two years won't be put in the pool, but literally every other registrant will be put into the pool and it will just be a complete random selection from that pool of people. Um, what I would say, we are co conducting um, a CPD review coming up in terms of just our standards and also looking at how we do our audits and also the requirements for the random selection. So these are things we are constantly reviewing um, because there's always different ways of doing things, that, you know, and it is a bit of trial and error, but at the minute that's, that's how our random selection works. It's completely random. So it doesn't look at things like retirement age or newly qualified students. Great, thank you, Natalie. And, and I think we've got time for one last question. Um, but but don't worry that we will uh, be collating any unanswered questions um, and put these up on the website with the recording. So if we don't get time today to look at your questions, be assured that we will be getting around to them and uh, sharing those when they're available. Um, so the last question I think we have time for is from Sam. Does audit take into account part-time workers and what hours are considered part-time? And that's for uh, that's again for Natalie, please. Yeah, absolutely. So in your summary of work, obviously, um, I recommend that you mention that you are working part time. Um, the obviously we do still expect you to do your CPD, but we do understand that it may be more uh, limited um, and maybe not as much as maybe someone in full time employment. Again, the assessors will consider that when looking at your profile, but we still encourage and um, even probably more so importantly, because you're doing a uh, part time that there is a mixture of learning there. So again, the rule of thumb still applies. If there's any gaps larger than three consecutive months, they need to be explained. Um, but the assessors will always consider, you know, your working environment and your, your contract if you are part time or full time. So please do mention that if you are selected and it will be considered. Wonderful. Thank you, Natalie. OK, I think uh, there are still lots of questions flooding in. I'm afraid we don't have time for any more um but as i say they they will go uh, we will uh, answer those and put them as a uh, sort of an faqs with the uh with the recording of the webinar when it's ready uh it, it will be going online uh, shortly so um please do have a uh, look out for that um you will need to be an rcsl team member to view the recording and we'll share it out um, in our usual channels like on our e-newsletter and in our social media channels um, so uh, just wrapping up now, I'd like to thank uh, all of the delegates for joining. There were quite a large number of you today, so thank you for um, sparing some time to join us today. Um, I'd like to say a really big thank you to the presenters, Natalie, Sean, Mark, and also thank you to Rebecca for the excellent sign language um, uh, alongside of this. Um, and thank you all for coming, and I think we'll close it there. Thank you. And of course, if you are selected for OCPC audit, um, good luck and do get in touch for help from us. Okay, thank you. Bye.